Let's begin. So let's just take a moment to just settle in and get mind and body in the same place. And we want to begin by establishing our bodhicitta motivation. So bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word. Bodhi means awakened or enlightened, and citta means the mind and heart together. So literal, literal translation is enlightened mind heart. The meaning is the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's very easy unfortunately, to look around and see all the suffering that exists in this world. Right now we have the hurricanes and you know, wars and so, so, so much other suffering and just unseen suffering like depression and you know, alcoholism and things like that, that people are going through and animals as well. Not alcoholism, animals typically, but <laughs> sometimes. You get like um, these monkeys in, you know, tourist areas that have monkeys that do get addicted to alcohol because they, they're drinking people's leftover drinks, you know. Yeah, but I think you get my point. It's not that. Uh, so, <laughs> so just thinking about the suffering of others and generating compassion for that and then adding to that the the wish to attain enlightenment for their benefit, to remove, remove suffering for them and for ourselves as well. So um, we are going to begin with a brief Dharma talk and then we're going to go into meditation. Um, we are ending a little early today because we have transmissions uh, from France from our teachers. Um, and so we're going to be ending around 11.30 um, today. So we can, uh, they start at 12, so we want to get ready for that. Um, so uh, does anyone, what questions do you have for me this morning, if any, that I can speak to? Otherwise, I, I have, as I said, something else to discuss. So today, I want to talk about being good enough, good enough. So and this comes from discussions with Dharma friends um, and uh, my own experience. As I just began here, you know, Buddhism has very high um, high goals, right? Um, attaining enlightenment, it seems something quite big. It is something quite big. And we might feel that's really too much for me. That's really out of my range of possibility. That's like the big, the big thing, right? But even on a, on a more day-to-day -day level, we can think, oh, you know, I'm not practicing enough. I'm not good enough. Something bad happens to us. And um, we feel like, um, you know, um, I'm not a good enough practitioner or, hi, come on in. Hey, Linda. Hi, come on in. Have a seat. Better late than never, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not too late. Three minutes is not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> Do, is it okay if I take your picture and it would be posted? Is that okay with you, Tristan? Yeah? Okay. Because right. we never have a picture in here. Oh, actually, Eileen, can you make it brighter just for this moment? Sorry. Sorry. 
great. Good. Thanks. That's better. This room is so yellow. <laughs> you know, all the pictures look really yellow in here. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get out of it. I know you wanted to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I thought it was. Nope. <laughs> Don't I worry. I didn't run back there. No, I know. I was like, oh, I was gonna remember. I'll try to. Maybe Eileen. Sorry. Can you take one from the doorway looking in? Sure. Thanks. Sorry about that. Any yes. Question. Yes. May I use one of the bolsters to set rest my feet on, or is that? Of course. Not yes. No. Acceptable? Go right ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. My feet don't touch the cold. Oh. Back the Do you little shorty pants? I don't know well, that. Well, would you sit back here? Let's go. Uh, Thank you. One right. more. It's settled. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. So as I was saying, uh, so. As far as enlightenment goes, that is a step-by-step -step process. That is a one-step-at-a-time process. So it can seem really big from where we stand, but it is doable. And the fact that it is doable is provable, meaning, you know, there have been countless enlightened beings already. And there are enlightened teachers in our day who we can, you know, access and observe and learn from. So, you know, it is something that is possible. Will it take a long time? Probably for most of us, yes. It depends on our past. It depends on our, you know, how much we've practiced in previous lives. We could attain enlightenment just, you know, like that if all the conditions are right and we have, you know, done the work for that. Most of us are not really at that point. That doesn't mean that it's not possible. It doesn't even mean that it's not possible in this life, okay? Um, so it, it can seem, as I said, very big, very far away, but there are a lot of steps to get to that point. And any progress that we make in this life takes us closer to that goal. It's not wasted, the work that we do in this life, okay? So if you think now, like, oh, I would like to be in Paris, you know, Paris is very far away, you know, and you can feel like, oh, that's not possible. But there are a lot of little steps that we take to get to Paris, you know, saving money and buying tickets and going to the airport and packing our stuff. <laughs> so, potty mouth, sorry. So <clears throat> it's the same with enlightenment. It's a small, a lot of small steps. Okay. So that's one aspect. It's not really the main thing that I want to discuss, but I did want to bring that up in this context of being good enough. Okay. What I see Westerners do very frequently is use the teachings to beat themselves up. And this is really, really something we want to be aware of and try to avoid. So, for example, you know, um, something devastating happens, you know, we're in the middle of a divorce. And then we say to ourselves, just let it go. Why don't you just let it go? Teachings say to let it go, you know. I, <laughs> Dude, it doesn't work like that. You know, it doesn't work like that. We would not, hopefully, we would not do that to others. So we really want to be careful that we're not doing that to ourselves. You know, the small, small example of that is, uh, and, and sorry, and as a Dharma friend, as a spiritual companion to others, we need to be really careful not to use the Dharma to lecture our friend who's suffering, you know? Like there's a time and a place to say things. And maybe somebody doesn't want to hear the Dharma at that time. Maybe they just want you to listen, you know? Or if they want to hear it, then, you know, we have to be really sensitive to that. 
So for example, some of you have heard this example already. You know, I was in, um, you know, I was living in France for a big period of time and uh, I had this um, small cutting board from my grandmother's house that still smelled like my grandmother's house. Like no matter how many times I washed it, it still smelled like her house. And it was precious to me. It was a nothing thing, but precious to me, you know? And I was talking to somebody in the kitchen at the retreat center and uh, doing my dishes and I dropped it and it broke. And I said, oh no. And, and she said, well, everything's impermanent. <clears throat> You know, and I just want to be like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> non-violent for us. Um, it's not kind. It's true. It's very true. Yes, everything is impermanent. But it's not kind to say that to someone when they have just experienced, you know, a loss. Okay. Someone who who's going through a lot um, was writing to me and said, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to talk to any of my Buddhist friends because I didn't want to hear, just let it go. And, and I said, that's not a compassionate response. You know, it's really not a compassionate response. So we want to be really careful that we don't do that to others, but we also want to be careful that we don't do that to ourselves. You know, yes, of course, you know, it would be wonderful if we had compassion all the time and bodhicitta all the time. And we were practicing four hours a day. And, you know, every moment we were resting in equanimity and had pure vision and on and on and on. That's great. That's a worthy goal. But if we forget that we're human beings, and if we don't acknowledge, like, this is where I'm at at this point, then we're actually working against our own progress. We might feel like, oh, it's, I'm going to progress if I beat myself up with the teachings, if I compare every, every thought and, you know, action that I take against, like, what a perfect practitioner would do. Like there's a balance, I guess, right? There's a balance to that. Of course we want to improve. Of course we want to see like where we might be failing or where we might not be doing our best when we could do our best. And we don't want to just say, oh, it's good enough in that sense. You know, oh, it's good enough. I did a half-assed job, it's good enough. You know, we don't want to do that. But at the same time, we don't want to expect perfection from ourselves and then just feel bad 24 hours a day because we're not perfect. Okay. In relation to that, it's very helpful to remember that we have Buddha nature, what's called Buddha nature, which is translated sometimes as basic goodness, which is a translation I prefer, right? So what does that mean, basic goodness, or in Buddha nature? Really, I think the best translation is enlightened nature. Because the teachings say that we are fundamentally already enlightened. So this path is a matter of removing the obstacles, removing the veils to experiencing and understanding our enlightened nature. So... The reasoning behind this idea is that once someone attains full enlightenment, it's impossible to go back <clears throat> to a state of being unenlightened, okay? Once one attains full enlightenment, they're enlightened and that's it. There's no going back. So, therefore, we must already have this enlightenment within us. This is connected to another teaching that all compounded things are impermanent. So, compounded means anything that is made of two or more parts is compounded. Okay. 
So anything that comes together must necessarily fall apart. Okay? All compounded things are impermanent. So enlightenment is not something that we create. If it was something that we create, it would be compounded and it would it would fall apart. It would be un un like we we would be able to undo it. Okay. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So I think that if we find ourselves in that state of um, putting ourselves down because we're not perfect in whatever way, particularly as it relates to the teachings and as it relates to practice, then it's really helpful to remember, oh, I have enlightened nature or I have Buddha nature. I'm a, I'm a Buddha, actually. Pema Chodron, who probably most of you know, um, she's uh, an American nun. She's written a slew of books. She's very, very good. Uh, um, she she talks about this practice of you know remembering that she's a Buddha. You know, she's like Buddha falling on her face. You know, <laughs> Buddha making a mistake. You know, and it's just like I'm a Buddha. You know, when we were um, at the center for the last day. I don't know if you're aware, just in, yeah. So, um, you know, everything was gone and, you know, I was there just kind of being in the space for a little while before I left. And uh, I was sitting in the window area where the, um, in the temple. There was no chair, so there was no place to sit down. I just was sitting there writing in my computer. And I was like, oh, this is where we had the Buddha statue. You know, and I'm like, oh, it's the living Buddha here now, you know? And it's just a sweet thought just to think like, oh, I'm a Buddha, you know? And all of these others who are a Buddha and all these animals are also Buddhas, you know? It's a way also a very um, helpful way to relate to others because we're not the only ones who have Buddha nature. Everyone has Buddha nature, you know? So if we see others in their in their goodness in their in their purity it becomes easier to deal with whatever perceived faults we see in them you know it's a very similar to the idea of divine spark that exists in other faiths you know we see the divine in others and we see the divine in ourselves. And then it's kind of a more, the word keeps coming to mind, it's like smooth, it's not really maybe the right word, but a sort of smooth respect, you know. And what, why I use the word smooth is like respect, if we use the word respect, kind of has hard edges, you know. Oh, hi, Sandra, thank you. Um, so it's respect for others, but not, not with no hard edges, you know, just kind of acknowledge, acknowledgement of others, uh, basic goodness and good in nature. So that's all I'm going to say, unless there are questions about that particular topic. Okay. All right. So let's do some meditation. So everybody's in chair, so we are going to just make sure our feet are flat on the floor. If you are at home and you're sitting on the floor, you just want to sit in a way that's comfortable for you. Then hands should be either palms down on the knees or palms resting on top of each other in the lap like that or with your fingers on top and your thumbs touching like that, whichever is most comfortable for you. Arms are relaxed. Back is straight, but relaxed. Back of the neck is also straight and the chin is tucked in a little bit. Shoulders should be back slightly. So normally what I do is just roll my shoulders back one time. 
And you can feel right away it kind of opens up your chest a little bit. Mouth is closed, but relaxed. Tongue resting on the roof of the mouth. Breathing through the nose. Ideally, the eyes are open, looking down in front of you. A few feet, just a relaxed, lowered gaze. Now we're going to bring awareness to the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the nose. And that sensation is going to be the focus of our awareness. So the aim is to maintain continuous awareness of that sensation, of the breath coming in and out of the nose, and letting the thoughts come and go without running after them, without judging them, without attaching to them. Just a thought arises, dwells, and disappears. It's replaced by another thought that arises, dwells, and disappears. Continuously like that, we maintain the breath. Maintain awareness of the breath. Probably we're going to get distracted at some point. That's perfectly normal. It's perfectly fine. As soon as we realize that, just gently bring the mind back to the breath. So let's start there. I'll ring the gong to start and also to finish.
Or you can begin to count the breaths if you like, counting either every in-breath or every out-breath for a total of 10 breaths. Counting helps us to realize more quickly when we've gotten distracted because we lose count. So if you find that you've lost count, just bring the mind back to the breath and start again at one. This practice is a practice. It's a practice in recognizing when we are distracted, recognizing when we are aware or concentrated, and bringing the mind back from distraction. So when we get distracted and then we realize we got distracted, that's a victory. That's us doing the practice properly. So please... Again, don't use distraction as a way to beat yourself up. Just focus more on the fact that you realized you got distracted than on the fact that you got distracted. Getting distracted is definitely part of the process. So you can begin that now with the counting if you like.
Bring your mind back to the breath. Body should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining the posture. Mind should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining awareness of the breath. So no tension, just a light touch. We're aware of the breath, but we're also aware of our surroundings, different sounds, sensations, but mainly the breath. And just focus on that, letting the thoughts come and go like clouds in the sky.
it's such a tiny sound compared to the other gong, you know? <laughs> the gong, the, we had this giant, we still have it, but it weighs a ton, so just put at my house for the moment. But it's this really big, beautiful uh, singing ball. And make sure it's bong, 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 bong. It's really nice. So, um, any questions about your meditation practice or comments that you would like to make? Okay. So, one of the main benefits of meditation is that we, through practice, we begin to see that we are not our thoughts and emotions. Normally, we very strongly identify with all of our thoughts and emotions without question. We don't question it, you know? It's just, uh, I am angry, I am depressed, I am this, I am that, you know? And so they have a power, an unnecessary power over us. And we end up just reacting in the world instead of responding with choice, right? We have these just um, habitual responses, like knee-jerk reactions to our life, to things that happen to other people, to ourselves. And <clears throat> through meditation, we begin to see that these thoughts and emotions are not real, they're not solid, they're not permanent. They're just, like I said, like clouds moving through the sky. And so they begin over time to have less power over us, and we begin to have more choice and more control in our life, how we want to be, even how we want to think, how we want to speak. All of that is connected to meditation. It's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why meditation is so important. It's also important to remember that meditation is a skill that is improved through practice. That's why it's called practice, right? And, you know, if possible, it's really great if we can meditate every day, even for a few minutes, you know, but to do it on a daily basis, um, again, if possible, uh, is really, really, really helpful. We keep that momentum going. We come once a week to a group meditation like this and sort of get a little jolt of, you know, whatever, <laughs> injection of base, half base. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, my friends, some of you know Ron and you see, yeah, they, they came up with a, a fundraising idea that we may use at some point called um, Finding Dinner Peace, <laughs> <laughs> where we would have like, lesson in how to cook vegan food and then we could eat vegan food together. So I kind of dig it. It's, it's pretty cool. Finding dinner piece. <laughs> so yeah. So meditation, it might seem, well, it not just seem it is. It's something very simple, not always easy, but very, very simple. Mindfulness of breathing practice. Just watching your breath, letting the thoughts come and go. There's not much to it, you know. But at the same time it's extremely powerful really extremely powerful. We, uh, you know, like what I already said, we start to realize, like, oh, I'm not a, my thoughts and emotions, and I can sit through these things, or I can experience them and let them go. But also it helps us to inc just increase our concentration, just our general concentration in day-to-day -day life, our awareness, because we start to notice more quickly Oh, I'm totally distracted. I'm just like on another planet, you know? And we bring the mind back to whatever it is we're doing. It also is a big aid in in, in having compassion for others, actually. <clears throat> because for, in so many ways, you know, one is that the more that we meditate, even simple meditations like mindfulness breathing practice, the more we sort of learn to see how our own mind functions, right? How anger is suffering, how, um, you know, how it feels to be full of anxiety, all of these things that we experience, but we rarely look at, you know, we rarely take the time to really look at those things. 
And seeing those things, we learn more about how others function. And we all are individuals. We all have different thoughts and emotions and so forth. But anger is anger is anger. You know, we might get angry about different things. The intensity of the frequency of our anger might, might differ. But we know what anger is. We all know what anger is. So if we learn, like, in our own mind, like, oh, this, when I'm angry, I'm actually really suffering. And we can have compassion for others who are angry, which we almost never do. Right? Um, so in that aspect, it helps us develop compassion for others. And just in the awareness aspect also, because when we, you know, in, in Shantideva's text, this one with Bodhisattva, <clears throat> which some of us are studying together, um, I don't know which chapter, we'll come across it at some point uh, in that class, but he, he talks about a kind of casual, um, like casual harming. I, I don't know the words he uses exactly, but it, it's that idea of like, just by not being aware of others, we can harm others, accidentally harm others, right? Unintentional, unintentionally harm others, right? Just by virtue of the fact of not paying attention. Which it sounds like weird, but if we look back, you know, we'll see that that actually happens quite a lot, you know. And our default mode tends to be putting ourselves first, which is like, it's not an invitation to feel guilty, boys and girls. Okay. What does somebody say? Oh, there's this, uh, there's a trans um, TikTok creator that I love so much. She has a saying, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to find it. It's kind of like, um, anyway, inclusive of the they, of the days. The he's, the she's, and the things. So, um, anyway. <clears throat> so, if we are present, like meditation brings us into presence, into being present in the present moment, right? Then we're more aware of what's happening around us. We see when others need help, or we see when we might be um, unintentionally harming someone else, right? And so in that sense, it also helps with compassion and compassionate activity, compassionate speech, you know? Um, yeah, so I don't want to talk too much more. But so now we're going to do um, the practice of exchange called Tong Lan. Have you done that practice before? No? So um, this practice is to develop our compassionate heart kind of strengthen that. And the essence of it is taking on the suffering of others and offering them our own happiness. It's kind of the basic, very broad stroke of this practice. Um, but as we talked at the beginning about kind of being gentle with ourselves, um, I want to do this practice for ourselves, for oneself. So there's typically four categories of individuals that we can do this practice for. One is someone that we love a lot. The second is someone who's neutral to us. So maybe someone that we know or we recognize, but we don't have particular feelings of like or dislike for them, strong feelings of like or dislike. The third is um, enemy, so-called enemy, so someone we really dislike. And the fourth is oneself. So developing compassion for oneself is what I want to do today. Okay. Self-compassion is really important. Right. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, like this is a step-by-step -step process and, you know, we have Buddha nature and all that stuff. But also to remember that this whole path, like, is very gentle. There's a very, you know, there's an understanding that it is small steps. And, you know, there isn't a single passage in any of the teachings where the Buddha where the Buddha or another advanced being is is um, yelling at us, you know, and and um, just putting us down. It's not never ever about that. Okay, it's ultimately this whole path is about removing suffering for ourselves and others. Okay, so because we don't have that much time, I'm not going to explain anymore. We're just going to go through the practice. 
In this practice, if you want to close your eyes, just go ahead and close your eyes. If you want to leave them open, that's fine. Otherwise, the posture is the same as for mindfulness of breathing. Okay. So we're going to begin by, <coughs> pardon me, um, I'm going to begin by, again, just bringing mind and body together. Bring awareness to the sensation of the breath. Then I'm going to ring this. I just call it a gong because it's easier to say than singing bowl. I'm going to ring the gong, listen to the sound as long as you can hear it, and then just let the mind settle, just let the mind rest. Now imagine in your heart center, so the middle of your chest, a very bright white light like a shining star. And consider that you're breathing in gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy through all the pores of your body. All of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center until there's not a single particle of smoke left. There's only light. Thank you. Pardon me. And consider that you're breathing out this white light, cool, clean, clear, very bright, through all the pores of your body. Now, imagine in front of you, another you facing yourself. So the you that is meditating is the part of you that is in touch with your Buddha nature, your basic goodness, your innate wisdom and compassion. And the you that you are visualizing is the part of yourself that is suffering and confused and pain. So the first thing is to look at yourself with love and appreciation and without embarrassment. Just like you see others in your life who you love. Appreciate your many good qualities your kindness, intelligence, and so forth. And then bring to mind whatever ways you're suffering, you know better than anybody. Physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever you're going through. Generate compassion for yourself. Forming the wish that you be free of these sufferings. That you be happy and at peace. And then consider that all your sufferings, whatever they are, Take the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy, 
and this smoke leaves the visualized you and it comes to the meditated you. And you breathe that in through all the pores of your body. And all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. So there's not a single particle of smoke left. There's only light. And then you offer yourself happiness, peace, healing, joy, and adding to that the wish that you attain full enlightenment in this very lifetime. And all of that takes the form of white light, cool in temperature, clean, clear, very bright light in weight. And you breathe out this white light through all the pores of your body. And the light goes from the meditating you to the visualized you. And when the rays of light touch the visualized you, you see all of your suffering just lifting off of you and disappearing. And you breathe a sigh of relief to be free of this burden of suffering. And you feel so joyful. And the meditating you also feels joyful for being able to do this for yourself. Now we extend that out towards all beings. First imagining them all around us, front, as many beings as you can conceive of, stretching all the way to the horizon. To the right, again, as many beings as you can imagine, all the way to the horizon. Behind, countless beings all the way to the horizon. And to the left, as many beings as you can imagine, all the way to the horizon. So now you're in the middle of a sea of sentient beings, each one of whom, like you, wants to be happy, wants to be free of suffering, yet suffers nonetheless. And so we consider all these sufferings, take the form of gray smoke, again, hot in temperature, heavy in weight, dark, it leaves all of them, it comes to you, a great deal of courage and love and compassion, you breathe that in through all the pores of your body. And all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center till there's not a single particle of smoke left, it's only light. Then you offer all of these beings your own happiness, giving it away, your own good fortune, along with anything at all that they may need, and adding to that the wish that they attain full enlightenment in this very lifetime. And all of that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, very bright. And you breathe out this white light through every pore of your body. It goes in all directions as far as the eye can see. And when these rays of light touch every single sentient being, their suffering just lifts off of them and disappears like fog in the morning sun. They feel a tremendous sense of relief 
for being free of suffering and deep peace and joy. And you also feel very joyful for being able to do this for them. Now you let go of the visualization altogether. Gently bringing the mind back to the breath. Using the breath to bring and keep the mind in the present moment, here and now. So Sharon's going to pass around the closing prayers. If this is not your jam, that's totally fine. Thank you. You don't have to join us. You don't have to join us. We begin with um, prayers for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. These four prayers are for Dalai Lama and our two main teachers and then all the teachers. If you're watching on YouTube, you will find a link to these prayers in the description. In the description below. Oh, I feel like a YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe. Like and subscribe. Okay. So, okay. So we'll say these prayers then. Kanri wa we kue shinkan su pandare wa manu juwe ne chene se wan de zen so yi Shall <laughs> Samsung Natre Gopota Tene, Lachet and the Shaitan Taike Show. Lama Kungam Sampo Suade, Chuju Puse Ruo Suade, Trine Tashin Gepa Suade, Lama Dandre Wame Pashin Gibu. Now I we dedicate the merit with this first prayer, which we'll say once in English, once in Tibetan. The remaining three we'll say just in English and then the hundred syllable mantra. By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May you defeat the enemy of wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So nandi chase Tolling a patron on Panchashi, Gagana cheap along to buy. See, bait so they draw a draw a show. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish evermore and more. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain. Until then, may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world, ever absorbed in the display of divine forms and primordial awareness, appearance, sound, and perception in the state of divinities, mantras, and dharmakaya. May I, inseparable from the practice of the profound and secret great yoga, attain within the essence of mind the state of one day. Om Vajra Sattva Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sattva Tenopa Tishta Dredo Me Vawa Sudo Gayo Me Vawa Subo Gayo Me Vawa Anuragdo Me Vawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Karma Sutsa Me Chitam Shriyan Guru Hum 
So, um, thank you so much for coming this morning. And I apologize for ending early, but we have the transmission, so that's why. Um, first sun, first Saturday of the month is family meditation. So, if you have kids or you know anybody with kids, um, that's good. That's a good time. Come and have a good time. <laughs> and you can ask Rachel about it because she brings her kids almost every week, every time, I think. The remaining three Sundays are group meditation like this. Normally we go until 12. Um, we hope to be uh, doing a, a, a Thanksgiving, our typical vegan Thanksgiving potluck, but we don't know where. So we need to start thinking about that because that's coming up like... Quickly, Maybe sooner than we think. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I'm not exactly sure where we're going to do that, but we'll figure it out. So um, that's always been like one of my favorite things: is everybody getting together and making a vegan Thanksgiving dish. And there's, I always include a link of just a bajillion different recipes that are um, beautifully veganized for that. So um, yeah, and it's just a chance to you know socialize, get together, have a have a nice time. So please be looking out for that. And um, and that's it. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you to the ladies for setting up and also taking down. If they, if you want any help, we could maybe help them to to dismantle this thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. For, thank you, you two bites. Bye. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to end. There we go. Okay.